Praising what is lost makes the remembrance dear. So said William Shakespeare. On Canada Day weekend this year, I visited the Canadian War Museum of Military History and the Canadian Aviation Museum, both in Ottawa. They enriched my appreciation of our country's sacrificial service to preserve the freedoms we enjoy. On this Remembrance Day, my 94-year-old guest is going to enlighten us about the very secret, highly significant role he and many other Canadians played in World War II. It is a joy to welcome Orville Marshall to the program. Thank you for being part of this very special program today, Orville. Thank you. And thank you for your service. As we unpack this amazing story, you use the word grabbed. You were grabbed for Secret Service when barely out of high school or still in high school. What were you doing that was so needed? Well, I, I had uh, uh, military training in the Reserve Army uh, while I was still in high school, uh, but uh, uh, it wasn't until 1942 when I decided to join the RCAF because of my long interest in uh, aircraft. And uh, when they found that it had a net radio amateur license, they said, we just got the job for you, which they wouldn't tell me for a long time. But uh, it turned out that it was uh, the new field or secret new field of radar that I was eventually trained in and served overseas. Okay, uh, just to backtrack a little, 1938, you got your amateur radio license. That's correct. You built a radio station? Oh, yeah. And <laughs> uh, you had to pass fairly stringent uh, uh, government requirements technically and uh, and the Morse code and I had my amateur radio station and uh, but when war broke out uh, our, our licenses were suspended. Mm -hmm. So many interesting things here. Um, it was 1942 that you were invited to join an unidentified secret electronics program. As you've already said you weren't even sure what you were involved with. That's, well, I decided to involved in the Air Force, but I didn't know what this program was until much later. And when I got the radar school, and we had to take a special oath of secrecy, and then we were exposed to the workings of radar. And you took an oath of secrecy. Uh, this is really high-level stuff. Well, radar was new. It, you tell me it wasn't even called radar at that point. No, uh, it was called a code name, Radio Direction Finding, and so we were known as RDF technicians. And, uh, but uh, radar is an American term, which was shortly, was adopted later uh, by the uh, RAF and RCAF. And it was really the British who desperately needed to ramp up this technology. The incredible thing is that uh, it wasn't until 1935 that the concept even of radar was demonstrated and uh, between then and when war broke out in 1939 they developed the technology and built the equipment and there were a number of radar stations in operation to defend Britain when war broke out but many more were added later of course. Mm. Really it turned the tide of the war and a key in the Battle of Britain. Well, it certainly did, and uh, it enabled uh, the ground controllers to position our fighters uh, with minimum time in the air because we didn't have very many of them. And uh, so they'd see that they would see on the radar screen the incoming bombers, and then the controller would direct the fighter to uh, to the, their position, and, and then they would attack. You know, I can't help but think of the scene in the movie, and we know the history of Pearl Harbor. Uh, where the the enemy planes were reported, but was it because it was still such a a young technology that that no, maybe the main, news main wasn't though, though, that uh, the U.S. was neutral at that point and uh, they were careless. Just didn't expect it. Yeah, interesting. I wonder how many Canadians know that there was a secret training base for this this new technology in Clinton, Ontario. And you were there. Yes. The, uh, in 1941, the Royal Air Force decided that they needed uh, more training facilities. And, of course, there was the threat of Britain being invaded. So they set up a, a special uh, camp uh, at Clinton, north of London. And, uh, and in the camp was a 
highly guarded area and that's where we did our studies. And each night our notes were locked up in a safe and then if we had came back that evening to study, the safe was opened and we were given our notes to work with. Orville, you say that it was almost a year before you knew what you were really about, what you were involved with. Yeah. It was so secret. Yeah. When did you go overseas? Well, uh, I didn't go overseas until about a year later. That was in uh, 43 because new kinds of radar kept evolving. And uh, I just finished one course at Clinton and there'd be new radars. And because we didn't know which radar we'd be working on, we were trained on many of them. Hmm. And uh, in 1943, or 1943, I'm sorry, 1944, uh, they had a requirement for a radar officer in Mediterranean theater. And uh, I was picked for that and uh, ended up uh, on the Pathfinder Squadron in Italy. Wow, North Africa to Italy. What an adventure, really. It really was. How old were you? I was about 20, 22, just, I guess. Just a young I was in Canada guy. one day and North Africa the next because most people went over a troop ship. But uh, because of the priority for my posting, I, I flew in a cargo airplane across the Atlantic to North Africa and then eventually to Italy. At some point, you were in a plane that went down, not shot down, but it, it went down. Well, uh, we were, the reason I was there that they were changing aircraft types and we'd fly the old airplane back to Algiers and I'd go back looking for radar spares and, uh, and the, the pilot hadn't flown this type of aircraft for quite a while and on takeoff, just as we were airborne, or almost airborne, he lost control and we crashed and went over in a field, but, but we all walked away from it. You came back from this uh, incredible uh, adventure and at the end of the war, pursued this stream of study in university? Yes, uh, electrical engineering. Well, I decided I wanted to continue my education because I couldn't afford to go to university before and the government was uh, fairly generous with veterans. And uh, University of Western Ontario, more commonly known as Western, okay. uh, started a new course called Radio Physics. And uh, I learned about it from my brother who had been in the Air Force in Canada and discharged before I was, and uh, so I took this radio physics course and graduated in 1950. Would eventually work with GE. Also married just a month after you got back from yes. the war to yes. your fiance, Bette, yeah. who uh, sadly left us in 1999, she died. Yes, you're right. But what a story, and here is the thing. I mean, my dad used to push shrapnel around his forehead. It was just under the skin, but he did not tell war stories. The one time I remember he did, I went to bed, and I remember crying in my pillow, afraid of being bombed. Isn't that something? Um, you didn't tell a lot of these stories either, Orville. No, none of us did. It wasn't until about the 1980s when people were retiring and kids started saying, Grandpa, what did you do during the war? That the books started coming out, both on the aircraft, the war itself, and radar. And there's been a tremendous number of books, not a tremendous number, a number of books. That uh, And then we started having reunions. Uh, uh, and First one in Coventry, 1992. Coventry, England. I've been there. I've seen the bombed church, the rebuilt church. Uh, tremendous place for for war history. Coventry, this was the first big reunion of uh, radar people and 200 Canadians went over for it. Now that included the spouses but uh, 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 during one of the dinners you were talking to the person next door and afterwards my wife said I learned more about what you did during the war in the last couple hours than it did all the time we've been married because <laughs> we never talked about it. Can you tell me why? Well, Can you explain why? I think we'd had enough of war. You just and, wanted to move beyond. And uh, we were preparing for new careers, and a lot of us went back to school. Not all, but a lot did. And uh, uh, people were getting married and having families, and uh, so the, it was a different priority. Until you meet someone who has lived that chapter with you. Then you could talk and, and talk and talk. away you go. How many other... You had that first reunion and then several after. Well, they started holding them in Canada uh, on an annual basis in Ottawa a couple times in Kingston and London. And uh, uh, 
other than your classmates from university, which you might see there, you didn't know the people, but it didn't matter. You, you, you were curious what they did because there were so many different kinds of radar. The British government gave a letter of appreciation to each Canadian, everyone who was part of uh, who, radio personnel, for their contribution to winning the war. Do you know how many Canadians were part of this service? It started off at several thousand, and by the end of the war, there were about 5,000. And in the Royal Air Force, ha about half the radar people at the end of the war were Canadian, which is most unusual. Isn't that something? We should be proud. I think rightly proud of this service. Secret though it was, is there anything to see in Clinton, Ontario, Orville, today no, of this? No, uh, it uh, was closed down. It became a, a broader electronics base after the war. During the war, radar people were kept separate from the communication people, but after the war, they were all combined. And uh, for a number of years, Clinton was a communication and radar center, mm -hmm. and it's now been closed. But there is a museum in London, Ontario, called the Radar Museum ah. that's attempting to preserve some of this information. Good. They need to talk to you. Well, they have, and I've contributed material to them. All right, because I want, I want you at home to pray for Orville. Can you believe this? 94 years young and sharp as a tack. And 20 years ago, you put together a 30-page memoir, which you are updating. Well, I did it just for family. And it was in a very old uh, format, and I've had it recently scanned into Word format so that uh, when I finish my family history that I'm working on, uh, I intend to upgrade that and put some pictures in it because we now have the technology to do that. See, I told you there'd be something to pray about. I think we have a, a vested interest in this wonderful slice of history that you are going to be providing for all of us, Orville. God bless you. And uh, on behalf of all of us in Canada, thank you for your faithful service, for using the very unique gifts God gave you. Well, thank you for giving me the chance to talk a little bit about it.